Hello, everyone, and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Laura Noland, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for tuning in to our latest virtual CEO roundtable. Our first 100 re registrants for today's roundtable will have received a fresh lunch delivered to your door or a gift card to order your meal. So while you are beginning to enjoy those great meals, let's get things underway. As a quick reminder for everyone who has joined us today, we look forward to your participation during this event. So please feel free to add any questions that you may have right into the chat. And as usual, for the last 15 minutes of this hour, we will move our conversation over to LinkedIn, where you can engage with our participants directly. Simply type in hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or click on the direct link that will be posted in the chat. Once we're over there, we'll answer any questions that may not have been answered on camera. Now, if you have any questions about upcoming roundtables, whatever it may be, such as how to register or how to participate, just reach out to us at our website, jsa.net. By the way, just a reminder to mark your calendars, our next virtual roundtable will cover lessons learned from COVID-19 and predictions for the new year ahead. And that'll take place on December 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So without further delay, let's get started. Our topic today is best practices for partnerships in next-gen network infrastructure. In any given year, your next-gen network infrastructure requires a highly collaborative effort between you and your partners to ensure effective execution. And in 2020, from the pandemic to the floods to fires and other challenges, Relationship management has become critical for business survival. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our exceptional executive lineup who will weigh in on what it takes to develop, manage, and maintain valuable business partnerships. Joining us today, we have Manish Mata, VP of Marketing for Extinet, Dean Campbell, CTO at Light River, Frank DeJoy, Vice President Network Development at Render Networks. Ryan Barbera, CEO of Data Canopy, and Bill Steen, Director of Indirect Channels and Alliance Partner Marketing for Comcast. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Pleasure. Yes, Laura. I'd like to start off with just a brief introduction from all of you. If you could tell us about your company and your role. Let's start with Ryan. Hi, yes, yeah, thanks again for uh, for having us today. Um, this is Ryan Barbera with uh, Data Canopy. I'm the CEO here. Uh, Data Canopy is a uh, global uh, cloud services and infrastructure as a service provider. Uh, we have offices uh, in North America, Europe, and in Asia, and we focus very heavily on hybrid and multi-cloud integration. Yeah, let's go to Manish. Thank you, Laura. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Manish Mara. I'm with Xnet Systems. Uh, Xnet Systems is a uh, is the leading uh, independent, privately owned uh, owner and operator of distributed networks, and uh, we are part of the communications infrastructure. Uh, we, you know, uh, we design, build, own, and operate distributed networks, which include small cells and DAS. Um, we utilize a private, um, a uh, purpose-built uh, fiber network to, uh, to, uh, to offer services, uh, all for the uh, carriers, for the MNOs, for the enterprises and building owners. Okay, let's go to Dean, please. Excuse me. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, Dean Campbell, I'm the CTO of Light River Technologies. Uh, we're a network integrator. We design and build and help our customers deploy uh, telecommunications networks um, loosely kind of defined as the critical infrastructure. So that's your telephone companies, your cable companies, um, light rail, a variety of networks that, you know, we, that keeps the world running on an everyday basis. Thank you. Let's turn to Frank now. Hi, I'm Frank DeJoy, I'm Vice President Network Deployment. Uh, Render provides a construct, construction management uh, SaaS platform that transforms design data into deliverable work tasks sequenced by software for optimal geospatial delivery in the field. 
Our platform enables paper and, and, and uh, eliminates rather paper and manual handoffs from the workflows. So crews in the field can use iPads to very efficiently uh, complete work in real time. Uh, our clients include telcos, co-ops, ISPs, CLACs, construction and engineering firms across the US, Australia, and beyond who are deploying fiber, wireless, small cell uh, networks at scale. Uh, in the US, our clients have delivered broadband to over 700,000 homes and businesses. Thank you. Okay, hey, let's go to Bill. Hey everybody, uh, Laura, thanks for having me on. So most of you are probably familiar with Comcast. Um, I'm part of Comcast Business, which is an $8 billion uh, division within a larger organization. We have around $2.4 million business customers and have a, a pretty deep portfolio that we sell through direct and indirect sales channels, including uh, data, networking, voice, security, video, and, and managed services. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, I got a little choked up off camera there. <laughs> so thanks for bearing with me. We're gonna start off the questions today with the digital age. So in today's digital age, enterprises have no choice but to modernize their network infrastructure. So what are some of the challenges that businesses face when designing and deploying a next-gen edge-ready network? And let's start with Ryan. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, um, uh, Laura. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of different issues that organizations can face. And um, I think that regardless of size, they're, they're pretty ubiquitous. Um, we've seen a lot of movement in the last few years away from the more traditional premise-based types of infrastructure and organizations really starting to move to uh, geographically redundant or, or multi-geo types of, of infrastructure. And that, that creates all sorts of, of issues. Um, you know, we really break it down into security, uh, access, uh, speed, meaning how quickly are you able to uh, deploy and or reach those networks, and then the cost for doing those things. So as we talk to organizations, what we've really seen is that there's an awareness and a knowledge that um, there is this next generation of technology that needs to be implemented. It's required not just for internal process, but for clients as well, which I know some of the other panelists will discuss as they, they face that uh, a little bit more head on. Um, but, you know, what is the cost to do that? Um, finding the right partnerships in terms of how you're going to actually integrate um, your networks and, and start that digital transformation and move things away uh, from your existing infrastructure out to the edge. Um, how you're bifurcating and, and cutting apart the different parts of your network. Um, it's, it's a complete organizational redesign, and that can oftentimes be um, intimidating, uh, especially for technology folks that have done things one way for a very long time. Um, nobody wants to have what we call an, an, RE, an RGE, a resume generating event. Um, so when we come in, we need to make sure that we're, we're really working with people and that we're helping them understand the security concerns the access concerns, the speed, and then ultimately the cost for those types of deployments. And uh, Manish, would you like to weigh in? Uh, absolutely. So I'll build on what Ryan said. I mean, today's workforce is, is increasingly dispersed. I mean, we've seen, we're seeing that this the pandemic effect that's happened. Um, the applications have gone to the cloud. The enterprise applications are now residing in the cloud. You know, data suggests that roughly 70% of of uh, the enterprise apps are now residing in the cloud with you know, roughly about 90% uh, by the end of next year. So the infrastructure too has to be decentralized. And th this is something that we have focused on as, as a company at Extranet. We've decentralized the infrastructure where the access part of the network has been, has been decentralized and come closer to the user. Um, now the core network is also coming, becoming decentralized and in, in, in getting close to the user as part of the edge network. Now you've talked about uh, the next gen edge ready networks and, and there are five key areas that we feel um, that we should focus on because keep in mind that the workforce today is highly mobile. So the, the, the use of mobile in the, net, in, the, in, the, in the workforce has increased tremendously in the last you know, few years, but even more this year. So if you keep that, that fixed mobile convergence in, in mind, and you have to bring in 
you know, five key elements here. So the first part that we feel is the network scalability. So the ne network has to scale. To make it next gen, the network has to scale. It has to scale to demand. Um, it has, the, the services have to be predictable. So, so the, the, there has to be service level guarantees that come into play. For the service to be, services to be predictable, you have to build in the redundancy, you have to build, build in the diversity in the, in, the, in, the, in the network itself, in the access layer. You have to bring in low latency um, applications. So the, the network has to go, has to be high speed, high bandwidth. So this is really important when you, when you get to this whole 5G world, which we are all going to, but the mission critical services have to be below one millisecond. So how do you make it, you know, ready for mission critical services? How do you make the network ready for the high bandwidth, you know, usage that is required in the financial world in the, in the healthcare? So all of these have to come together. And then at the end of it all, there has to be secure. The network has to be secure. So it has to be highly scalable. It has to be predictable. It has to have the low latency, the high bandwidth, and highly secure. So this is all something that's, that, that are key challenges right now for us you know, as an industry as we go about you know, providing that end-to-end -end, you know, uh, user experience you know, that's required, both in the fixed and the mobile world. Thank you, Manish. Dean, can you weigh in? Yeah, that's a boy, tough act to follow these two guys. Um, I, did, I, I did want to talk about two points, and I think we're all in, in uh, violent agreement here. We're talking about how network services are becoming just increasingly um, critical to any kind of business out there. Um, the workforce is dispersing. Um, it's becoming um, the lifeblood of the business to be able to communicate between your employees, between your apartments and locations. Um, at the same time, we're, we're seeing almost all the businesses under tremendous competitive pressure. So they are really beginning to focus on their core competency. And what we're finding, quite frankly, is this, this ability to be able to partner with other companies, find trusted advisors that can help them through the decisions so nobody gets a resume generating event, um, to help them with this new technology, with the speed with technology is changing, help them make these decisions help them do the research and put together great solutions, and then help them get implemented. Um, we're asked every day from customers, you know, help us because we view this as critical and becoming more critical to the lifeblood of our company, but we simply don't have the people with extra cycles to do the research and help us move forward and keep up with as fast as technology is advancing. So, you know, increasingly it's, you know, uh, you know it's becoming about how good is your Rolodex? That's how you keep up your competitive advantage versus can I do it all myself? And we find a lot of value working with clients in, in that kind of role. Thank you, panelists. We're going to move to another thought topic, IoT de devices. With 3 billion new IoT devices estimated to deploy by 2023, what steps are being taken to prepare for IoT and Wi-Fi 6? So let's start with Bill. Hi, um, thank you so much. Uh, Looking at that, it's a really interesting topic because I think a lot of customers, you know, are very familiar with Wi-Fi, but but are, are newer with the IoT side of things. And one, one nice advantage Comcast has is we have a whole company focused on IoT called Machine Q. So Machine Q has been out there for years. Uh, it is building lots of different solutions for different verticals, for different lower uh, technologies. Uh, in talking to uh, VP of Engineering a few few days ago, coincidentally, he was talking about the new Comcast Center that we, we recently completed about a year or two ago. And uh, the 65-story tower has 2,500 Wi-Fi gateways in it to serve the people that are, you know, in the building. We have 16 uh, machine queue gateways for our IoT within the building. So the amount of low latency, low power, uh, range that is provided by IoT is, is, is truly amazing. And it's, it's really about, you know, using the right hammer on the right nail for customers that are looking at how they do inventory management, how they do temperature management. And there's so many fascinating use cases where customers are getting uh, significant savings where instead of going, gosh, I, you know, we have 10,000 mousetraps set up across our, our warehouse, you know, which one's pop last night, right? IoT can enable that. You can put a chip on there and say, oh, these six did. Go pick those up. 
So there's just so much potential there that we're seeing it as, as a real opportunity to, to talk to customers about automation. All right, thank you, Bill. Manish, would you like to add? Um, sure, um, Laura, thank you. Um, Bill, Bill said all the right things, but I'll just build on this in, 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 in terms of what we are seeing out there from an infrastructure perspective. When people talk about IoT, they talk about Internet of Things. Um, and, and, and our CEO, Jim Hyde, when he joined uh, a couple of years ago, um, he talked about the, the, the real IoT is the infrastructure of things. And this is something that we've kind of built into our, into our, uh, into our model here and in, within the company is we have to build the infrastructure of things, the real IoT, before we can do the Internet of Things. And while, while we see uh, a lot of activity, a lot of activities going on, a lot more has to happen. So in a lot of the, in, in a lot of the industries today, when you're building the in-building network, if you may, um, whether you're in the industrial side or you're in the healthcare, it doesn't really matter. For IoT to happen, the networks have to be built from within. And when I say the network, again, go back to my previous comment about mobile networks. The mobile networks, which has wires attached to it, the fiber that comes into to attach to it, that becomes really critical to actually enable that whole Internet of Things, you know, the, the, the IoT. That network has to be built from within and is being built today, but it has to, a lot has to happen today to make that work. So now you talk about the edge and how does that play in, right? And, and, and you talk about the building management systems, for instance. Um, there is a, a need for data collection to happen for IoT to work. And that really means there has to be a high density of sensors you know, in place for the data collection to happen. And, and that high density of, net of sensors requires a high capacity network within um, the building or buildings, campuses. When you then, then you'll have to look at how does the data get controlled? And for the data to get controlled, you need a, dis a dispersed you know, set of sensors in the, in the facility. And for that, you need coverage in the network. At the end of the day, it's all about the data engine. The edge has to be, has to be put closer to the user or to the end you know, usage, you know, wherever the use case is happening for the, for the, for the system to really work. And, and right now, we are in very early stages of building this infrastructure of things you know, for the future. Thank you. Building infrastructure that provides strong investment protection is imperative to support today's needs and in the future, unpredictable demands. What types of solutions are you recommending that are scalable, flexible, and limit business disruptions? Let's start with Bill. Yeah, I, th I think I have a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, one of the things that we're definitely seeing is um, as we rolled out our SDN platform three, four years ago, we, we built it over the top so that customers could use different underlay networks. And we are seeing a lot of customers really look at configuring it in a high available manner with, with a, a fiber connection, a, a coax connection, and an LTE as, as for backup. So I think one of the things that's very important for investment protection is, is, is two things. One is you know, partnering with the right network providers that can really provide that scale so they can take you from you know, two megs up to 10 gigs, you know, depending on how you grow and exactly how big of a network you need to have and how much speed you need to have. But then also thinking about, you know, the difference between symmetrical um, and, some of the, and some of the things that can be put in like Ethernet over HSC and some of these types of technologies. The other thing that I think is important is, is to work with partners that give you a lot of pricing flexibility or, or financial flexibility, meaning providing fully managed service, so you can outsource some of the, the support, but then also having no ETS or, or early termination fees. So you can, you can trial stuff, put it in five sites, make sure it's right for you. And if it isn't, then you can step away from it so that you're not locked into you know, a, a contract for, for that overlay. Thank you, Bill. Ryan, I would like to ask you the same question. Appreciate it. And, and I, what I was saying was I think Bill has really um, hit on um, the the flexibility and the scalability, um, and I think in the world that we're in, and, and it's been sort of the theme throughout all of the comments that we've heard, things are changing at a pace that's pretty unbelievable in terms of the marketplace in general, and then how companies are approaching it. So specifically, when companies are picking infrastructure, 
what it really comes down to now is scalability um, and elasticity. Um, you know, the the all of these questions are really driving toward the same thing, which is that organizations today really need to take a look at their infrastructure from a standpoint of how quickly can we scale this up? How quickly can we build? And, and then what is the cost point for that? I mean, Bill was really talking about things like ETFs um, and managing costs. I mean, uh, the reality is if you had endless budget and, uh, you know, endless time, you could do just about anything. But for all the clients, and I'm sure most of us work with, the discussion always realistically is um, how do we, you know, and I hate to use the term, but how do we future proof this? And so the technologies that we're recommending today um, really are designed to allow for that quick scalability, whether it's on the cloud platform that somebody's looking at, uh, the orchestration or the automation tools that somebody's using. And I know we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, taking a look at uh, the underlying network in terms of the actual connectivity, whether they're using SD-WAN, whether they're using uh, uh, Flex type of, of solution. So those things are so critical because as these organizations are growing um, and as the use of data, as IoT, as all these things are starting to come more and more into play, the flexibility and the elasticity, the scalability is the most critical component for us in terms of starting to pick some of the infrastructure um, and then what tools can you incorporate into that? As I said, you know, there's some tools that are really great. They're really cost effective, but they're very b bespoke or limited in terms of what we can incorporate into that versus other tools that may have a little bit more service required up front, but give an enormous amount of scalability in terms of where we can go. And so we are really starting to take a look at technologies that allow for, for a scale beyond what we thought was possible, you know, even three or four years ago. Frank, can we get your thoughts? Sure. Um, I, I recommend, uh, you know, of course, solutions that are scalable, future-proof, secure, and, uh, and use open architectures. Um, you know, examples include, you know, standard edge models or even pre-staged pre edge centers, cloud-based software management tools that connect the locations and ecosystems during deployment and operations and, and even open and, and, and very secure API, API so all partners can, you know, can access. So the fundamental, you know, fundamental capabilities and building blocks for efficient deployment and, uh, and operations and maintenance post-deployment. All right, thank you. Our next discussion point talks about automation and analytics. So how can automation and analytics help simplify operations and resolve user impacting issues? Let's start with Ryan. No, great, thank you. Um, so this is actually an area where, where Data Canopy just believes that there's um, almost blue ocean in terms of, of the things that are going on in the space. So um, you know, obviously as a, as a cloud um, architect, we believe very heavily in automation and orchestration tools. So, you know, technologies like a Kubernetes, Docker, uh, leveraging microservices and sides of applications, um, really refactoring and optimizing applications to work with the edge network um, to create efficiencies that potentially previously didn't exist. And it's been talked about again a couple of times on this call in terms of things like um, distributed network, leveraging geographical, um, uh, efficiency and least, least cost latency to, uh, to help clients. And so when you really start to get into taking a look at analytics, taking a look at how we're interpreting the data, how we're then turning that data into business case and using that data to design where uh, you're going to build your next facility or where you're going to put your staff or any of those types of things, um, we can actually start to use that data to do that. And then leveraging that automation, whether it's containerization or some of the other technologies that we're using for faster deployment, more cost-effective deployment, leveraging microservices for better performance. So this particular area for us, and I probably got a little more excited than I needed to for this, but uh, these types of technologies in the space that we're in are really what's starting to differentiate how um, our client base can use cloud technology um, to improve their organizations and to better integrate with the edge, which um, before now has been a lot of very heavy lifting on the network side, but we're really starting to see that marriage of 
uh, the application and, and cloud to the edge in, in a way that's uh, much more seamless than it used to be. All right, thank you, Ryan. Frank, would you like to weigh in on this one? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, big data and, and analytics can, can significantly speed network deployments and simplify operations to really help resolve user impacting issues. Um, from a deployment perspective, geospatial data from field personnel can streamline productivity, reduce paperwork costs and schedules at render. We've seen uh, our network operator and construction partners use our geospatial technology, big data and automation to reduce large scale deployment schedules up to 50%. From a maintenance perspective, operators are using big data and machine learning analytics to more quickly isolate network outages or even detect potential performance issues uh, before they happen with, with predictive analytics. Right, thank you, Frank. Dean, what are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, thanks. Um, so I share some of the excitement in this area um, it's been interesting to watch over the years as um, the networks themselves, the technology that powers a lot of these networks um, has been somewhat opaque for quite a long time. And just recently now, we're starting to see, you know, from the ground up, from the equipment on up, the ability to see what's going on, to get information out of the gear, to get statistics and performance monitoring out of all different points in the network. Um, and whether you're on the enterprise kind of consumer side or on the service provider um, supply side of this communications, you know, the ability to see what's going on is critical um, to see not only what's wrong and fix it, um, but to proactively see what might go wrong. Um, you know, we've been, we've been involved in this for a number of years. I've actually developed some software solutions. We have a product um, and we've got case after case now of, users that are eliminating truck rolls or reducing truck rolls, really reducing mean time to repair, by being able to see what's going on in the network and being able to see not only what's going on now, but what might be going on three weeks, three months from now based on performance statistics. Um, from the consumer side, we're even talking to a number of our um, enterprise customers that are really looking at these analytics to produce uh, measurable business gains, looking at where per application performance their infrastructure is not supporting the applications in the way they need, and that really does impact productivity, business efficiency of their operations. How do you streamline your uh, network connectivity to give you better application performance and increase performance of your field personnel or your you know, office personnel? And how do you really fully lever leverage the resources that you are buying? So capacity planning types of things where you can limit your overall spend, but yet increase business capability. All these things come out of those big data numbers, come out of that um, instrumentation of the network and being able to see what you're using, what's working, what's not working. Tremendous, tremendous area for uh, increasing productivity and efficiency in this communication space. Yeah, we love it. All right, thank you, Dean. New trends in digitization and hybrid cloud have a direct impact on how networking and application security are implemented across environments. What services enable secure workloads in any cloud environment? I'd like to start with Manish. Thanks, Laura. So I think, I think first off, I think we should, we should um, um, look into how the physical layer of the network interacts with the transport layer and the and the application so at the at the base level you need the physical layer which is again you i come back to the infrastructure you need the infrastructure to deliver that that high level of of uh, security and and services that come into play so the physical layer has to have that high capacity fiber has to have the endpoints from a from a mobile network perspective enabled the the transport layer today is, is extremely important because you've got to be able to connect to the data centers in, in a secure environment. So, so you have to connect to the data centers and you have to connect between data centers. Um, you have to have a diversity built in so that the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, network is, is never, um, there's no single point of failure in the network. Um, 
And then you have to have the application layer built in, which is the connectivity to the cloud. So all of that has to work together. It has to be a dedicated, you know, flexible architecture like we talked about. And in, in, that, in, that, in that whole realm, you have to have the predictability of the, of, the, of the services come into play. You have to make sure that the network can scale for the right network requirements. And then it has to be secure. So it has to be highly encryption based so that you can, you can do the, you can, you can transfer data in the most secure environment. So as we transition to this hybrid cloud, in fact, as we have transitioned to the hybrid cloud, this, this, this secure environment has become even more in, in, important and the underlying network that, that takes this, this, this uh, or provides you the connectivity has to be, you know, both on secure end to end. Hey, thank you, Manish. Ryan, we're going to send it over to you. Um, I, uh, I, I was saying I, I couldn't agree more with what, uh, with what Manish was saying. Um, I actually wrote down a few notes for this particular question. And the number one thing that I talked about was, uh, was security. Um, because what we see and, and, you know, data canopy, we, uh, like to say we work a lot with regulated or complicated companies, right? And the companies that we work with are healthcare, financial services, government, you know, those types of organizations. Um, and so they're dealing with issues of latency. They have very specific location specific requirements. So we work with organizations that are doing work in Europe and Asia and, and all over the globe that have specific local requirements in addition to their own internal policy. Um, and, you know, uh, if you're doing work in China, you have a whole nother bag of issues to deal with, the great firewall and so on and so forth. So when we start to really talk about how you integrate a hybrid multi-cloud approach and how you're actually managing workloads, um, it's probably for us from a security standpoint, one of the most, um, um, the, one of the biggest conversations that we're now having with our clients, because it used to be really, it was a more monolithic type of environment. And as these services have started to get chopped up, pushed further out to the edge, and then you have different uh, people in different locations accessing these services from all over the globe, the complexity of that security. And to um, Anisha's point, that includes everything at every single layer. So, you know, the technologies that we're recommending now go all the way from your physical layer, all the way up to the application layer where uh, we're doing different services in different locations. Some services can't be in some locations. So um, when we talk about really managing workloads in, in our multi-cloud and our hybrid cloud environments, um, we're doing it almost location by location, but then you still have to have the, the master um, kind of security policy as well. So that for us is probably the hardest and the number one conversation that we're having is how do we really execute on a security strategy across uh, a, a geospatial type of an environment? Okay, thank you, Ryan. You do have a chance to redeem yourself on the mute button. I think we have a, a few more comments and thoughts coming up for you in just a bit. So get ready. <laughs> And next, we're going to go to Dean. Dean, I'd like to get your thoughts to round out uh, the last thoughts on, on this discussion point. Yeah, I, I think you know, Manish and Ryan have covered a lot of it. Um, you know, we work with uh, both providers and consumers um, across a number of industries, and they're now dealing with um, a, a complex environment where uh, their particular industry may have data at rest and now increasingly data in flight security requirements. They need to be able to secure their communications. Um, and at the same time, their network is being more and more fragmented. You know, we've talked about this move to the work at, you know, work from home kind of model. Um, you know, we're seeing the rise of, you know, at first it was the branch kind of SD-WAN model with remote branches running over, bring your own connectivity. Now we're seeing this rise of the SASE kind of secure edge where it's almost down to an individual user. Um, almost all the, all the industries we're working with are really moving toward almost a zero trust model where you have to really secure almost every device, every communication pathway. It is the number one conversation we have with customers right after, can you get me from A to B? It's okay, but now I just, I can get there, but now it needs to be secure. I need to be able to monitor it and I need to be able to rely on it. These are, these are the number one conversations we're having with people across the board. And just to you know, echo a, a comment I made earlier, you know that 
the criticality of network communications. Businesses can't rely on handing paper from one desk to another. They have to be able to communicate electronically or they just can't do business today. It's becoming their lifeblood. Okay, hey, thank you very much. And this is our final uh, discussion point uh, for this session. We do have a few audience questions that are coming in. We're going to get to address those as many as we can during the time we have together. So let's start with this last question here. Uh, what next-gen infrastructure predictions can you offer? So this is going to go to the entire panel and just weighing in on your next-gen infrastructure predictions. So let's start with Manish. Thanks, Laura, again. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's the prediction that I would make is we, we as, a, as an industry are going to go back into the grassroots and, and trying to, again, get back into the trenches and figure out you know, what is the network architecture, you know, really um, require for the, for the network of the future? And the network of the future, you know, and, and today, I mean, we are at a, at a, at a significant, you know, uh, I would say inflection point here, where, is, where what we are building today is going to define, because we have the early, early stages of 5G, you know, and, and, and 5G as a technology, will transition, you know, a lot of the, the, the activities that we take, you know, not only in our personal life, but in our business life also, right? Um, where you get, get back to is how do you build that, that physical, you know, the underlying network with, with fibers, small cells, macros, all working together? How do you um, get that edge infrastructure in place? Because the edge infrastructure will be super important. You see different companies in our industry do different things with the edge. You know, you have the tower companies bringing in the edge, you know, at the tower space. We are working at on, on different, you know, uh, bringing the edge even closer to the user from an inbuilding perspective, okay? So we are looking at Pico hubs, we are looking at uh, micro hubs, we are looking at nano hubs and seeing how these hubs are going to be, you know, uh, designed and, and deployed so that they can enable that edge, you know, you know, you need the edge intelligence, you need the edge routing, you need the edge caching and content distribution and so on that has to happen. All of that requires the edge to be closer and closer to the user for that, for that ex end user experience to happen. And then, and then everything has to then connect to the cloud. So at some point right now, what we are looking at is, getting back to the grassroots and designing that network of the future. And that's my prediction right now is, is 2021 will be about enabling this transition to the cloud. But at the same time, the CIOs and the, and the, and the visionaries are going to go back to the grassroots and look at how you truly design this, this, this network that can, that can do the, 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 can enable the applications that will ride on 5G and, and the future Gs that come into play. I thank you, Manish. Bill, let's turn it to you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with a lot of what um, Manish said there. I, I think the other thing that we're excited about is, is Doxis and, and where that leads us in terms of getting into Doxis 4.0 and, and, and getting to 10 gigs at some point to, to keep those, those wire connections. I think the other two trends that, that, that we're seeing is um, kind of the, the use of software-defined networking and, and the virtualization of, of hardware, basically the branch office, that a lot of customers are looking to simplify that experience and not have a box for their UTM and a box for their wireless and a box for their firewall and a box for this and a box for that. Let's convert that all to software. Let's make them VNFs. Let's have a universal uh, CPE that, that's at that branch. And let's be able to push policies and be able to centrally manage that um, will, be a, will be a big trend. The other thing I think that uh, this work from home phase will continue. You know, we're going to uh, see, you know, people continue to, to have that kind of a model, which will drive some interesting uh, challenges, I guess, for security, as well as for just having a, a good high speed, you know, experience for, for those people working from home so that, um, you know, they'll have their residential connection for internet for, for the kids and their schoolwork and their gaming and, and, and the spouse doing their work but then also dropping in a second connection and really having kind of a business class, you know, internet connection into the home to really drive the high performance that people will need, you know, as, you know, work from home continues. Thank you, Bill. Dean, let's hear from you. 
Um, so I've got a, a couple big themes, I think, that are, that are pretty, um, pretty broad based across the networks, um, on both the supply and demand side. One is simplification. Uh, we've seen, you know, the hyperscalers, the web scale guys come in and be very disruptive over the past, you know, probably 10 years now, um, in driving the complexity out of the network, driving down the cost per bit, that kind of thing. And, and part of their strategy was to drive down the complexity. Um, so we're seeing increasingly the, the different network layers being collapsed, the devices being collapsed. Um, so they're simpler to use. They're more transparent. And along with that automation, we, we talked about SDN a little bit, I think Bill mentioned, you know, the ability to actually manage these devices programmatically so that now we don't need 10 people watching a network to make sure everything's running. We let the network monitor itself and just alert somebody if there's a problem that needs physical intervention. Um, so this ability to simplify, to automate, and that's going to enable, you know, Manish talked a little bit about um, the IoT and the, the scale of the networks and the, the, the reach of telecommunications, you know, from, from not just, you know, a guy sitting at a desk in an office, but now it's to every street light and every road sign that might be talking back to the network and providing information or getting, getting its instructions. You know, that, that complexity, that, that vast increase, increase in reach and scale of the communications networks you know, we need to simplify, we need to automate it, and then that's going to just unleash, I think, this IoT wave of uh, increase in scale. Thank you, Dean. Frank, what are your predictions? Okay, yeah. I, I uh, certainly expect uh, an acceleration in the shift to edge computing, not, not only due to technology and applications that we've talked about, uh, but also due to the the broadband demands caused by the COVID pandemic. I mean, we're already seeing the impacts, some, some of which we see in everyday life, like the video streaming companies, uh, you know, downgrading default uh, video, uh, you, know, you know, video settings from HD to standard, and, and, and some maybe not so obvious things happening like, uh, wireless operators deploying uh, micro edge, you know, edge uh, data centers at, at, at the cell sites. Um, but I'm, I'm, I see that increasing uh, over time. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, no matter which IoT number of de connected devices forecast you see, it's all in the billions. I've seen, you know, you know, nine, you know, grow to, 50 billion over the next few years. It, it, it's all very high, and we didn't we didn't talk much about uh, the increased security risks caused by IoT devices. Many of these devices lack lack security uh, in 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 them, or or are neglected when they're deployed in an enterprise. Outdated software or default credentials that that can be used as backdoors into corporate networks. And it's a big concern of the enterprise. So, so even despite those risks, I still see the IoT deployment to grow, but I also see IoT security solutions uh, and practices uh, will grow. Um, and then finally, uh, well, two, two more things, uh, you know, this, this tremendous uh, demand for uh, broadband and video centric applications uh, will require, uh, you know, businesses and deployment teams to be more efficient, do more with less, and, and SAS based uh, automation tools and maintenance tools will, will enable that. And, uh, you know, also businesses should, should uh, engage ecosystem partners, know what they know, know what they don't know. Uh, and engage, uh, you know, companies and, and uh, partners such as those on, on this panel to, to help make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And Ryan, let's get your thoughts. All right. Well, I'm unmuted. It's a good start. So, but, um, yeah, I, um, I, I agree with a lot of what was said here. Um, I think that where I see the future is that there, there really won't be something that we think of as um, the edge anymore. I think that um, as 
IoT, as we see more devices connected in, as people start to um, really leverage the types of technologies that we've always historically talked about as business, but now get more into end user and consumer and as people work from home and as there's more e-learning and all of the things that, that we're seeing, um, I think you're just going to see a massive increase in consumption, a massive increase in data, a massive increase in, in everything. And I, I actually don't know that we can quantify it yet. Um, I think that we think of ourselves as um, big consumers of data and consumers of network and edge today. Um, but I, I think this is really the first inning of a nine inning game. Um, I think you're going to see an acceleration of that as organizations become more decentralized. Um, or as they start to leverage these technologies in a more efficient way to broaden their own reach. Uh, as the cost for a lot of this goes down, you'll see more adoption in smaller companies, which will increase competition uh, with, with all organizations. So um, I don't think that we're seeing um, a small shift in the market. I think that this is going to be seismic. And I think that this is really... Um, the next evolution. One thing that Frank said that does have me concerned um, is I do believe that we are also racing to catch up on security. And so where I think the future is going to go is that uh, we need to temper adoption of some of these technologies with the need for the right types of securities, because there is still a major concern in that space. And I do agree with Frank on that, that it's moving at a pace that you know, security always has trouble keeping up in general because of just the nature of technology, right? Um, but what we're seeing now is that it's it's moving way too fast. So, um, so, so that does give me a little bit of a, a restlessness at night. But I know there's a lot of smart people out there, including some of the people on this call that are working to to crack that nut. But I, I think we're just seeing the beginning of what is going to be a seismic shift in how data is consumed, used. Um, analyzed and, and how it affects our lives in all different ways, business and personal. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ryan. Appreciate it. And unfortunately, that is all the time we have for our on-camera event, our virtual event, but there's more to come. Hang on. Uh, I do want to thank our expert panelists for a great discussion today, informative, insightful, and definitely more conversations to be had on this topic. So thank you again. Thank you. Sure. And on behalf you, Laura. of Laura. Sure, absolutely. And on behalf of our panelists, I'd like to thank you, everyone, for tuning in and participating in today's roundtable. Just a quick reminder, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour to answer any more of your questions on LinkedIn. And we did get quite a few questions come in uh, through our chat box, so thank you so much for sending those our way. You will see our speakers over on LinkedIn. Just search hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or click the direct link in the chat box. You can see it right there in your chat box to continue this Q&A session. And viewers, if you were one of the first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one and last one for 2020, which takes place on December 10th where leaders in our industry will talk about lessons learned from COVID-19 and predictions for the new year ahead. That is a wrap. So look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you over on LinkedIn and happy networking. Thank you. Thank you.